and we are live hello everybody welcome to another edition of our smart building series hope everybody is well out there um, and today we want to talk about disruptive trends fueled by ai and camera edge analytics and i'm really happy uh, to welcome nicholas from security and safety things how are you doing nicholas thank you james uh doing very well and good stuff uh, yeah very happy to, to be here as well so i'm going to ask nicholas to introduce himself and the company in a little bit and he's going to give a presentation but before i do that maybe just you know um set the scene a little bit um so of course uh, we want to make this uh, webinar interactive um so after nicholas's presentation where he's going to discuss some of these concepts um you guys have, uh feel free to uh, put in some questions um, and we'll attempt to answer them after the presentation. Um, best way to do that is through the Q&A uh, application. Uh, you should see that in the bottom of your screen. Uh, beyond that, we are recording this webinar um, and you'll be able to get a copy of that recording um, after we've finished. Um, it should go up on our website probably today or tomorrow. So please, uh, if you want to, share that with your colleagues or anyone you think you might be interested. Uh, it's pretty much it from me for now. So. Um, I will now hand over to Nicholas. Cool, thank you, James. And yeah, Welcome. thanks again for, for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I'm super excited to talk to you guys about uh, new technology, what exciting user use cases it enables and how security and safety things can contribute to this. Um, but before we get um, started, um, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is uh, Nicholas and I work at the Product Growth Manager at security and safety things. So I've planned to give you a short introduction um, to our company and the platform we offer um, before we then dive right into the topic of disruptive technology and how this enables then exciting new use cases in smart building and smart city. So let's jump right in. Um, we are security and safety things for those who don't know us yet. Um, a Bosch startup, 100% uh, funded by Bosch and run fully independent as an investment of the World Bosch Group. And we are growing rapidly. We were founded um, just a little over two years ago and we have now 110 employees in three locations with our headquarters being in Munich, Germany and two development locations in Eindhoven, the Netherlands and Pittsburgh, USA. And before I now get started to explain our platform, I want to shortly talk about our company mission. And that is to really extend the use of security cameras to really become multi-purpose devices that can do so much more than just surveillance. And to achieve this, um, we created a standard operating system that can be used by all camera brands. And um, this OS then connects to an application store with an extensive selection of different apps for all kinds of use cases. And the operating system and application store are two out of four main platform components you offer. So let's look at the entire platform and um, consists of four main building blocks. See them here in the left-hand section of the presentation. And um, the standard operating system is uh, meant for manufacturers to build cameras um, on that. Um, we have a development environment for third-party developer companies to create these apps that can then be distributed through the application store and a device management portal um, for integrators and end users to then deploy and manage cameras and apps. And what you also see on the slide here is that um, we are a strategic partner of the Open Security and Safety Alliance, uh, short OSA, um, that consists of many companies from the industry like manufacturers, app developers, integrators, and so on. And they together define standardized, standardized building blocks that are then created or developed by SNST. So OSA defines the standards and we build it based on OSA and offer it for free to all stakeholders. And um, our business model is to participate in app sales through our platform. And with this standardization approach, um, OSA and SNST want to reduce the friction in the market so that stakeholders do not worry about integration, but can really think about innovative solution. And this topic of standardization actually leads me um, to the next slide and to a question that we often get, and um, that's what's the difference between OSA and ONWIF. And um, both are actually set up to make integration more easy, um, that's the goal, and 
on sign on with are therefore also more complementing each other than competing. And um, uh, on with um, has been around for, for much longer actually. Um, they um, came up when there was a shift from the analog to the IP cameras and they ensured that um, IP cameras can communicate to each other. So setting their communication standards and they are now also rolling out uh, more profiles. And the members of the on with are mainly camera manufacturers. Um, now, if you look at, at OSA, um, that goes one step further. It's represented by all major stakeholders in the industry. And also it defines and creates standard components together. And it uses on with interfaces as well. And building these components really ensures then a consistent experience for the user. Um, and this building blocks like the operating system is then taken um, from the stakeholders like the manufacturers. And this incorporates um, also feedback from all stakeholders and that ensures a frictionless ecosystem where apps can, can be created, sold, bought, and installed very easily. And the application, application store is really the, the heart of that. Um, it's in the middle of the ecosystem and that's the go-to place. And um, it's been live since the beginning of this year and it's accessible for everyone. Um, so we really have set ourselves the goal to help everyone find the best suited video analytics applications. By now we have 75 apps available there from 30 developer partners. And with this, we really cover um, a vast variety of use cases and um, throughout many industries, as you can see here on the slide. So please check it out. Um, you can visit it under store.securityandsafetythings.com and browse through the app details there. Now, we want to talk about the technology behind these apps today. Um, and um, let's then go to the next um, chapter. So AI, computer vision, deep learning, there's many buzzwords around that's also causing some confusion. So I would like to start off with quickly um, setting um, the scene here. So artificial intelligence um, is just the idea that computers can think intelligent like a human being. And there's different applications of AI, like speech recognition, fault detection, and computer vision is actually just one of that. And um, computer vision um, is the one that we are focusing on today. And that is about seeing and understanding like a human eye. And then machine learning um, is the fact that computers can automatically learn a given tasks. And there's different ways of or different sorts of machine learning. There's supervised learning where you feed label data to the machine, like um, pictures with, with a uh, label on it. Um, there's unsupervised learning where you feed the same pictures, but without a label. Um, so the machine recognizes based on patterns uh, and clusters um, um, those, those pictures and also to things that might not be obvious to the human eye. And then there's reinforcement learning. So that is, um, that the machines continue to learn from its environment and interacting with it. So one example there can be predictions that the machine does and based on feedback, whether that prediction has been right or wrong, and then it further learns on this. And a lot of, a lot of that is um, based on neural networks. And neural networks basically try to represent um, how uh, a human brain works um, in, in an algorithm. Um, and you see here a little sketch of a very simplified model with an input layer and a, a hidden layer where the, um, some, some calculations and weight, weightings are done and then an output layer that's, that's um, based on, on some sort of probability. And the more um, hidden layers and the more complex and deep these networks get, um, the, more, um, the, yeah, the, more, the more hidden layers, the more complex they get, obviously. And um, deep learning is just um, um, those neural nets um, with three or more hidden layers. And um, all this um, has been actually around um, for not only just since, since now, but, but since the 1960s. But the big step forward was now the availability of training data plus the possibility to compute that. And so the compute power that now really outperforms uh, logic-based algorithm, uh, algorithms. Yeah, so based on this, let's look at why this is really making a change now and, and how this is making a change to video surveillance and, and analytics. So if we talk about rule-based video analytics, um, that's what we've known until, until now or recently. 
And um, there are several key disadvantages to that um, that are reasons why this has not been as widely adapted as initially assumed. And um, it requires quite a high calibration effort and it's a hard coded. Um, so it's an inflexible solution. So I have one example here with a cat detector where you would, for example, program down the animal's length and the color range um, it lies in. And of course, this can create um, 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 false positives if you have outliers there. And um, I give you another example for, for false positives. For example, um, pixel movements have been used to calculate motion um, in many of those rule-based video analytics apps. And then a raindrop on the camera could already um, yield an alert. So up to now, this has not been very reliable. Um, a lot of um, manual interference were, was required there. And um, that led then to the fact that this was not as widely adopted. Now, if you look at AI-based video analytics, it has um, quite some advantages. It has a little to non-calibration. Um, the inferencing often happens on the edge. So it's a soft coded uh, program also. And if we look back at this cat detector, uh, you would, for example, feed them um, labeled uh, pictures with cats. And then the computer can then um, identify also cats he has never seen before as a cat and determine um, this. And there's actually a lot of pre-trained open source models that are now coming available. So you don't even need to um, train um, all this um, by yourself. So in future, there's um, with this AI-based video analytics, much less false positives, thus less human intervention. And you then also need to only look at uh, the relevant footage. And that uh, gives you um, also the possibility to reduce then the, the storage needs because you don't need to, to store everything all the time. So um, one example for, for artificial intelligence is also um, Siri, um, the Apple's voice assistant. And you all know when you have your, your iPhone in flight mode, Siri won't work even if you just want to set your, your alarm. And the reason for that is because it only works with the cloud. And this is actually the reason why edge computing um, is becoming um, and very interesting. And this decentralized analytics um, becomes more, more efficient over time. And up to now, we've seen that um, mainly in the cloud data processing um, was done. And um, of course, this causes a heavy load on the network if, for, if, for, if 4K video stream needs to be constantly streamed to the cloud. And this then leads to longer response times and requires quite some investments on infrastructure as well. Now with edge computing, the analytics is done on the camera itself. And this becomes possible through yeah, very powerful CPUs and GPUs like those you find in, in a smartphone. And this architecture then enables um, more flexibility, um, more hybrid models. That means the cloud will not become redundant, but the dependence on the cloud will be reduced and the advantages of each of those layers you see here can really come into play. And so app algorithms have access to uncompressed video data streams directly on the camera and, and can process it there. And uh, thus, instead of storing off footage, only metadata really needs to be extracted in the future. And then, for example, an alert be uh, sent to the cloud. And this also means um, less bandwidth requirements and thus low, uh, fewer latency issues. Um, um, lower uh, network infrastructure cost, and, and since only metadata is then sent and the analytics is done on the camera, um, there's also um, compliance with regard to GDPR, the European um, data privacy law. So all parts of the network will remain relevant, but in future, uh, there will be app calculations on each level. And to get these applications, there are also now marketplaces evolving on each of those levels that allow for much easier access to analytics. And um, those marketplaces, and some of them you might be already familiar with, for example, in the cloud, it's AWS or Microsoft Azure, for example. Um, there's also marketplaces for on-premise servers like um, the Milestone Marketplace that was um, recently launched. And what is now more and more evolving is marketplaces of manufacturers like Access and Robotics, and um, also the marketplace of uh, security and safety things that is open for several manufacturers that support the ecosystem. And the availability, uh, availability of these marketplaces really allow for sales channel shift. So software purchase shifts from pre-install to post-install. And that of course then also increases flexibility 
as um, there's um, lower integration and calibration effort. Um, and that's much more um, cost effective, of course. There's also the possibility to repurpose um, a camera. Um, look at the, the COVID-19 pandemic there. It was um, very interesting for, for many um, retailers, for example, to, to get um, people counting in or mask detection analytics. And also the, the niche applications um, will become possible. Um, so with those marketplaces, uh, the long tail becomes much more relevant. So overall, this decentralized architecture um, leads to a less hardware and more software um, focus. So in summary, AI video analytics, edge computing, and the availability of marketplaces will result in lower calibration effort, faster installation, lower cost on infrastructure, um, better app results um, through self-improving AI models, and the ubiquitous um, data um, um, will lead to many pre-trained um, AI models that are available there, as well as, of course, a large selection of apps for the marketplaces and data privacy that can be ensured through the edge computing. So based on this, um, let's look now at the interesting use cases that will be enabled through this um, in future. And um, I would like to start off with the smart building sector here and actually, actually with a classic security and safety. It's been around for, for a very long time. And this is of course, not only video surveillance, but uh, fire detection, access control, intrusion. Um, and what is new though, is that um, those platforms will become more and more video centric. So a camera is, 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 is very often involved in that. Let's look at fire detection, uh, for example, a highly regulated market um, in, in buildings, um, but there are already use cases where cameras make sense outdoors, of course, like here in this picture for, for detecting fire in the woods. Um, but we'll also see them coming in, in warehouses, for example, or on train tunnels. Um, uh, look at, um, at, at this warehouse, for example, if you have a big paper factory, you don't uh, want to wait until um, the, um, um, the smoke is already at, at, at the ceiling, um, then you have a big fire, you want to recognize it much faster. And this is where really you have decisive, decisive advantages with the camera. Um, the same holds too for, for access control. Um, so far it was always done with the card, but in future um, face detection makes absolutely sense here. Um, and edge computing actually allow to do this in line with data privacy regulations and for example, um, worker council regulations. Um, and that's not only relevant in, 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 in you know, office buildings, it's relevant in all buildings. And of course, also in, in retail um, where customers are concerned about video analytics and, and surveillance. And um, offline retailers can really become um, um, as data driven um, as their online competitors in future. And of course, as said, data privacy is a, is a big topic here, um, but they are not interested in the, in the constant video stream. They are interested in the statistics only. So they wanna see, for example, the demographics. They want to understand um, what gender and what age um, their, um, their customers have and what products they are looking at so that they can, can optimize their, their product portfolio or how they walk in the store so that they can optimize the store layout, um, how many prospects come into their store and how many leave as customers so that they can then also uh, steer um, on that. And as said, all this data um, would uh, not uh, have to be stored. It's sufficient to extract the metadata and to load the statistics in, in, a, in a Power BI, for example. And uh, what is nice is that you, of course, can also have several apps on a camera, so you can also monitor self-checkout areas. Um, in future, you might um, even be, be able um, to um, charge the customers um, right as he walks out the, the store because you've already analyzed um, what kind of products he put into his, into his basket. And I want to close here the, the retail topic um, with an um, example of, of, of an app um, from, from a third party developer on our application store, we created a simple customer satisfaction app um, that can be deployed, for example, at the exit of the store where customers can just do a thumbs up, thumbs down, um, being anonymized um, here and the statistics then go into a customer satisfaction tool here. And that's, of course, already very close to um, building uh, an own sensor. And that is actually relevant in a, in, a, in a lot of building because it actually 
enables um, efficiency gains and training the sensors is, is easy often for, for simple use cases and you can also cover several at once and examples can be for example parcel delivery detection or location of specific objects and you can see here um, i made a um, quick example with one of the apps on our store where i just um, um, put um, some some of my objects um, um, on the on the camera like my headphones my, my iphone uh, a mask and i've basically fed the camera or the app data um, and then i labeled it um, and um, if you have more complex objects you would want to um, place them there from, from several angles so that the, the camera has, has better um, possibilities to really train this and then you deploy and run it and um, yeah that's then screenshot here and you can see that um, it detects now here in this example this, this pens and, and also um, a pen for example that I haven't um, um, scanned before like the, the, the yellow one um, where he just based on this neural nets then can abstract and, and understand that this is also a pen and as I said this is um, interesting for, for very individual use cases that can um, um, yeah, ensure or, or enable uh, efficiency gains. So that's about um, the smart building um, topics. Let's look at, um, at smart city um, here. Um, and I wanna um, start here with um, typical use cases, um, real-time analytics. Um, you often have in smart city use cases, with busy areas, steering traffic, people masses. And here AI apps can, can tremendously help to steer the attention of the control room personnel to the right areas. So in future, some of the decision can also be taken by apps based on previous experience um, or predictions. Um, but for example, here apps can evaluate compliance of social distancing, um, mass detection, or blocked exit or walkways for crowds, as you can see in this, in this picture here. And then they could just send alerts or notifications only without also streaming the entire video um, and therefore um, ease the, the, the bandwidth requirements. Similarly, for, for traffic, apps can detect uh, traffic jams. Um, they can um, um, see accidents or also um, um, count how many passengers are, are in a car. And that's now for, for real-time analytics. Um, and what is even more impactful or what can be even more impactful is analyzing the data and giving recommendations on certain patterns to, to, improve, um, to improve this. And this pattern recognition can really help um, improve road safety and, and traffic flow and, and, and help therefore city planners to really detect accident critical roadways by counting near misses or to understand and then eliminate cause, causes for, for traffic jams. And yeah, as I said, um, this is um, um, really a big potential if, if new roads um, or bridges um, are, are built. And um, Last but not least, um, all this collected data can, of course, also be shared in, in real time, leading to a so-called data economy. So in that, that case, um, all sensors, stationary or mobile, um, can share their data through a central cloud among traffic participants. And this can then reduce accidents um, through warnings, um, for example, about upcoming congestions and improve traffic flow through adjustable speed limits or traffic light switching, just to make um, it more smooth. And all this is enabled by, by artificial intelligence, edge computing, and the marketplaces that then um, deploy these this apps widely. Um, yeah, so um, our solutions also enables um, this revolution. So um, be sure to, to visit the store here and browse through some apps for, for more detail. And with this, I, I wanna close. Um, thank you for your attention. And now I'm looking forward to your questions. Great stuff. That's super interesting, thank you. Um, well, look, there's a lot, a lot to um, pick into there, and um, I hope people have got some questions for Nicholas. I mean, I guess it could be anything about, you know, security and safety things, more, you know, about what they're developing, but also wider questions about some of those slides on, on um, applications of AI and, and edge computing. Um, Absolutely. So please, yeah, please feel free to uh, to contribute. Um, yeah, there's a lot I I took away from that. Um, I think the first one, um, you know, you showed, I think, in one of the earlier slides, uh, some of the AI use cases you identified. And I, and I know some of them are already kind of in your app store. 
I mean, you have any um, metrics on like what has been the most successful or the most the most used um, use case? Yeah, well, um, currently um, um, COVID-19 related apps are very popular, um, um, specific, specifically now with the, the second wave going up. Um, so, so retailers um, are very interested in, in, in this kind of apps. Um, um, and overall, um, I think the, the retail section, I mentioned that in the presentation, is very keen on getting, getting a better grip on data. So, um, so that is one of the, the sections that, that drives, um, um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's yeah. funny, isn't it? Retail often tends to like be an early adopter of like right, different types right. of technology. I think they've been doing things like analytics around people counting for a long time, haven't they? But yeah, not they did um, with with AI. Yeah, but but um, for a long time, retailers have been um, 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 because of the, the pressure on, on margin, really um, been been looking on on, on uh, or being very cost sensitive, and, and now they they actually start to see that. It's not only um, that they can um, yeah, ensure security and uh, ensure that um, 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 yeah, they detect um, any, any of that, but rather also this, this analytics um, and that they really can, based on this analytics, improve their store layouts, improve their, their, their product offering and therefore drive sales. And, and this, of course, then is a different use case for them to also in, invest more in, in camera system and, and specifically in software. Mm. And then I suppose they're moving towards, you know, this more automated shopping experience like uh, Amazon um, Go. Yeah, yeah, I think um, um, the Amazon um, Go example is 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 um, yeah um, very um, visionary and um, and very um, yeah, advanced already. Um, mm. um, so I don't think that this will be just around um, the corner. You need really a, a very much cameras for this installations um, to, to get this in place and as of today but and this will be um, um, yeah we'll, we'll move towards that yeah mm, I actually tested um, something similar there's a, there's a company here in uh, in Stockholm who have a, oh, cool. have a have a use case you can you can visit so I don't know anyone yeah. based in Stockholm Presbyr and have a have a store you can uh, like a small concept store but um, I tested it and it's um, it works quite well actually. Yeah. Oh, cool. Very interesting. So I was able to pick up um, a product and, uh, you know, I actually kind of just went for interest purposes. So I picked up the product yeah. and then you could see on your phone that it had identified what that was. And then I put it back and it was able to identify that I didn't have it anymore. So it's very good. And you, you, you enrolled before? I enrolled when I was there. So you, you have yeah. an app on your phone and you, you enroll on, and like you said, you put your payment details into that and then it then allows you access into the store. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. A uh, question here uh, is coming for you. Uh, yeah. What do you think are the key remaining challenges to widespread adoption of these new uh, capabilities? I think, assuming they're talking about mm -hmm. AI there. Yeah. Um, well, um, one of um, uh, the, the, the challenges is, of course, um, the, the um, adaption of, of, of this new cameras, because in the end, the, um, the architecture of the camera is, is, is new. They um, are, have quite powerful chipsets. So um, you first would have to um, actually um, in, in get this, this new cameras and install them. And um, of course, there's, there's right now a lot of um, um, yeah, um, installed cameras already in, 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 in those, those areas. So switching this um, will take some, some time, of course. Um, also, um, in, in the store, um, there, there is already, as, as I said, many, many apps, but I think really um, what drives this is, is also um, niche applications that will be then, then, then widely used. And, and for this, you need um, quite a, um, uh, a high number of, of cameras out there in the market that is really can, can come into play. Mm. So, you know, you mentioned social distancing and um, retail is one sort of successful or interesting use cases now. Um, you know, three, four, five years down the line, do you have do you have a feeling for what will become more successful with regard to sort of AI use cases? Um, what I, I mentioned, or what, what I had earlier in the presentation, was this, this this fire use case. I believe um, 
that is something that um, that can be very interesting when when regulations um, do do adopt that um, because um, cameras will go to every building so every building will be equipped with cameras so the, the nice thing really is that you have several cameras uh, several apps running at at once and um, and that I think is is, the, is, is a big um, game changer um, like you can have this fire detection app running and you can have um, some like let's take again this, this retail example you have fire detection app running you have apps running that um, detect um, 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 robbings or anything like that and you have you have analytics all at the same time and you can even um, if you have several analytics apps you can also have them have them speaking um, to each other so so apps on the camera itself communicating um, with with each other and I think this is really going to be um, then then um, the future mm, okay so more around the integration of different systems right yeah. then being able yeah. to share the data in and yeah. use it intelligently yeah okay but also what what we could um see in in, in smartphone markets um um with with this um, stores at the beginning um there were a lot of um applications there that that were quite um similar and and over time a lot of more a lot of applications came that nobody thought about and this is also something that we expect um as um, we made it quite easy for for outside developers um, to come um, or to to enter this market and um, to come with fresh new ideas that that no one from the industry has, has thought about um, just because they they have a different angle and come from uh, from different industries. So this is what the, what we believe is that that there might be um, apps um, in future that nobody has thought about today, but that make completely sense and and create a lot of efficiency gains or other um interesting use cases mm, yeah no th th absolutely we can come back to that point um a bit later got a, got a question here another one for you um we're trying to develop solutions for smart buildings based on vision uh, can you mention some more use cases apart from fire and access um, related to smart buildings yeah i mean of, of course um, um smart buildings and specifically office buildings it's always interesting um, to see um, occupancy um, seeing um, um, which floors um, um, have, have how many people there and um, you can steer um, uh, lightning um, and, and, and other things with it and, and th that's one of the, um, the interesting things again that um, that the camera can can um, by an API give out events and then um, steer um, other um, um, IOT devices in, in that network um, mm -hmm. so that is an, is an interesting um, use case um, um just thinking what um, um I'd, I'd add one um around uh, like predictive maintenance of some equipment like hvac um seems a few companies who are doing that who are using software to predict um not so much failure but also you know uh, looking at the system where it can where it can improve um prove its efficiency and then of course that leads to energy efficiency savings. Quite a few companies doing interesting things there. Isn't it? Yeah, and often what you also have during during night is this, this guard walks um, throughout the buildings, and obviously you can digitalize that to so have a mm. basically digital guard that that always scans um, um, for any um, yeah um, mm -hmm. anything that that, that is um, of of interest and and should be alerted. Something else I wrote down here as well, like um, in your description of, you know, the difference between rule based analytics and the, the more sort of AI um, analytics, which we're seeing coming through now. Um, you mentioned about this high calibration effort. Um, it, could you de describe that a little bit more? I wasn't quite sure. Is that to do with you saying like the amount of um, information or data that's required to train the algorithm? Is that is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean, you must be, let's take back this example of a, of a cat detector. You must come to, if, if you program that, right? And you need to um, then come up with certain certain patterns and you'll first need to then see what kind of size, for example, is, 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 is the cat, what, what color range works. And so you'll have a lot of iteration loops until you really have the feeling, okay, this is a product that now can go out to the market. and. And, and and doesn't come back with a lot of 
yeah, or too many false alerts um, attempts. So you really need to uh, work um, as, as, as a development company quite long um, until you really have the detector um, programmed in a way that it can go out to the market. And specifically, if you um, are not online all the time and, and are installed in an environment where, where updates um, cannot be driven um, over the air all the time, um, then uh, yeah, it is quite a high calibration effort there. You mm, probably okay. also, um, one, when installing it, need to um, see that it really has exactly the right angle it is programmed for, um, which is done the calibration on site. So yeah, this is just um, something that needs to be considered. If you have a camera um, with AI-based video analytics, you just mount it to the wall, it has a certain angle, and based on that angle, it gets trained, right? And then it will understand. Okay, so it's more about that it's automatically working. It's automatically yeah. training, okay, as opposed to doing like pre, uh, pre training and writing specific rules exactly. and telling it what to do. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just to let everyone know that, um, feel free to ask questions. We've got plenty of time left. Um, so uh, yeah, if you have any questions for Nicholas around around the work that they're doing or sort of more general questions about AI, please let me know. Or indeed, any questions for me, happy to answer those. Um, yeah, there was something, um, again, in like the smart cities uh, examples you gave, I thought it was really yeah. interesting when you were talking about planning, um, just, I mean, traffic around traffic, but I guess it could apply to any kind of urban urban planning, right? right. I mean, are you, are, you, are you seeing this happening now? How far away are we from, it's actually, you know, being put into place. Well, yeah, it, it, it really depends how many um, cameras are there already installed. And um, um, this, of course, is already um, um, happening to, to a certain extent and uh, where you have good coverage and uh, where you can also track um, that um, um, more than, than just one, one camera uh, field of view. Um, what you all, all often have as, as, as a problem is to really track um, vehicles um, throughout several cameras and basically this handover um, is difficult and, and then, um, for example, really um, detecting flows um, becomes more difficult. So if you, you can see this happening where you have a good coverage on, on cameras already and um, um, where you can do this, this handovers and really analyze the entire flow, but this is um, not many use cases yet. Mm. Mm. Okay, yeah. yeah. No, I think I picked up some, some press releases as well around, uh, around similar work, not so, sort of based on traffic, but more around yeah. people flow, architecture, designing of um, you know, urban space. Yeah, and what we've also seen is, um, or we've been in touch with uh, companies who, who have mobile installations actually. So they, um, they have mobile installations, um, they, they come to a specific city, they build up um, at, at um, some important crossings and their, their infrastructure set up, and um, then they, they monitor that for a week. And um, that is actually then sufficient um, to count, for example, um, nearby misses. And, and based on that, um, um, understand how to um, improve uh, the, the roadways there. But that's something that, that's very interesting and of course also lowers than, than installation costs because for, for things where you don't need um, yeah, real-time uh, monitoring 24-7, um, you can come up with a, with a, um, a temporary installation, you monitor that, and based on that you can then um, 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 move that to to, to a next um, important crossing and um, improve at the one that you've um, monitored and where you have the statistics on. Mm. Yeah, I guess when my one thought that sort of popped into my head there was sort of more than about like how West. I think it, these are absolutely great and useful applications. Mm. Like when you sort of talk about smart cities, it's then I'm always thinking, who is ultimately the customer? You know, who is the person that's going to pay for it? And of course, I suppose, you know, most cities, most of the big, certainly the big global cities have, um, you, you know, budgets for this, this kind of stuff and the administrations, but often, you know, they're not particularly extensive, but I mean, I suppose maybe is this kind of stuff able to use existing um, infrastructure, existing CCTV, uh, video surveillance cameras? Yeah. Um... So 
our the, 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 the normal camera architecture um, works with um, um, a specific um, um, architecture that um, our operating system would not run on a, on a existing camera. But um, um, one of our um, develop, um, camera manufacturer partners, Ambivotech, is bringing out an AI box that can be attached to a camera. You can imagine it like a, a Chromecast stick that you put into the HDMI slot of, of a TV. Before it was a smart by plugging it in, it is. And then you can basically run that, that operating system on that AI box and then deploy the apps on that. And with this, you can then also um, yeah, um, equip um, this, this installations that already exist. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. So it's sort of like retrofitting. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, older cameras. Yeah. So I guess a cheaper way of um, doing the same thing, right? Right. Yeah. Again, that kind of leads into a question I had around. Um, one thing you mentioned was that you can see the IoT platforms becoming more video centric, which I guess is something I, I, I do agree with, you know, like certainly just video recording in general is becoming pervasive, right? Like yeah. everyone's recording much more now, whether it be on a camera or, or, or video surveillance or whatever, right? Yeah, it's the um, most powerful, indeed, powerful sensor in the IoT infrastructure. Yeah, now. yeah. Um, but again, it's like we, uh, and certainly with sort of video surveillance and like, you know, we don't just cover video surveillance, we also look at smart buildings and some of the sensors that go into that. And we mentioned occupancy analytics as just an example, you know, and a lot of those companies are using um, different types of sensors, I think, basically, because, you know, you can, you can sense movement and, uh, and, uh, and, and the way person moves and in an anonymized way, right? Uh, without right. having to use without having to use a, a video camera, and I think the main reason just because of the expense, right? Um, so, but of course, you know, video cameras' cost is is coming down, and I think, you know, ultimately, you know, we can still move in that direction. But do do you think? Have you any sense of how long that might take, or or what direction you you see it going? Um, with regard to prices of video cameras? I think that, but also, you know, um, how how the video will be recorded as well. You know, will it be more, you know, is it just going, always going to be like a static video surveillance camera on the wall? Or are we going to be doing more, you know, body-worn cameras, of course, is, is, a, yeah. is, is a growing uh, use case with, within law enforcement. But is that, or even robot robots and things like that, right? Is, how, how do you see how do you see this market evolving? Yeah, yeah, I, I believe that there's going to be a mix of different um, camera types, and as you just mentioned, those, those sensors are also relevant. There's also thermal cameras that are relevant not only to detect fevers but also in areas where a normal camera just might be too intrusive. Um, and um, and I believe that this will be in in, in quite. Um, fast um, development um, at a certain point where um, you can ensure um, and, and, and that that you are in line with with the regulations, and you can can really um, uh, make sure that you have a future proof system. Because of course, no one wants to um, to install something where he has the feeling, oh gosh, um, next year I have to whip them out again and get the next generation like. It's sometimes with a, with a smartphone, right? So, um, but I believe we we are coming now to that level where where this this cameras are actually at a, at a stage where um, the hardware is not so important anymore. Um, there's already very very strong chipsets um, um, for for those cameras, and then you can really equip um, 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 uh, cameras um, on on a um, large scale and um, and repurpose them them with with apps. Um, and what I also see, or what, of course, the, the business model um, is, is um, going towards more and more, is it's not this one-time payment, but but lease payments and um, you know, for, for once for camera and also for um, for apps in particular that you are not buying the app, but you pay a monthly fee, and then. If, for example, um, the next generation comes out or a competitor comes along with a better solution, then you can switch very easily and make sure your system is, is, is always up to date and you always have the, the best solution um, for your use case in place. 
and I think this will really then then drive the adoption. And currently, another thing that's 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 still holding us back, and, and I talked about standardization and before and making this easy, um, is, is integration effort, of course. And if if um, it's very difficult to update a system if, if it takes a lot of manpower and, and many systems are also this kind of um, install and forget, right? Because never touch a running system, people are um, uh, afraid to, to, to update and, and that uh, things are like specifically custom-made solutions are not working anymore. And um, this is something that we really um, try to, to make much easier that, that it's more like a, a plug and play kind of um, solution. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think integration is 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 an issue, not just for video, but like across the building technology um, realm. Um, and you, you know, you gave some examples there. I mean, access. We talked about that. You, you thought that like video facial recognition is, is sort of an obvious uh, replacement for the card. And um, yeah. yeah, and I mean, do you see and, and again, and we can talk about a lot about those kind of use cases. I, ju I just, I just, I think it's really just a point like about standardization, as you said, like, I think that really needs to improve before we can see uh, more integration between different systems. Yeah. Um, there's a, a question here for you. Uh, I think maybe we kind of touched on this already, but uh, it might be interesting to elaborate a little bit. Uh, with the rise of video, uh, vision analytics, how do you uh, envision the future of buildings, uh, which is as of now are largely driven by uh, IoT? Um, yeah, I suppose that's a little bit more about how you see vision contributing to the future of buildings. Like, like vision in, in terms of, of cameras? Uh, vision analytics, they said. So I suppose that could apply to, you know, any uh, yeah. any type of, uh, of vision. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I mentioned that that briefly in the presentation. Just this this individualized sensors um, will become very relevant um, because um, there is many um, daily tasks that need to be fulfilled in buildings um, that just um, are not efficient um, and it's very repeating and that can be um, done by cameras. For example. Um, if you look at a hospital, um, a lot of um, high value objects are on wheels and they are going to be moved around um, and you want to know where they are, where they are. So it's, it's easy um, to just get an overview on where, where you, do you have those, um, those, those, those objects in, in your building um, to go there instead of yeah, searching it everywhere. So this is one example, um, I believe, where, where this can come into play. Um, if you have a good um, 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 overview on the building, um, you can you can do that. You can also um, have heat mapping um, not only in retail but in all kinds of buildings to see um, where a lot of people um, passing through. Um, now with the with the COVID pandemic, for example, that can be also interesting to see where you have very narrow ways and um, where you might need to do some some remodeling in your building. Um, so I believe. Um, a lot of um, um, use cases um, are still to come, and a lot of them um, are also going to be customized use cases and very individualized. And I think um, that's one of the uh, very interesting things is that um, <clears throat> based on, on specific um, apps, you can create um, your own individual solution that can, can help you in, in, in your yeah. Yeah, daily um, business, wherever the camera is, is installed. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. There's, there's a lot of optimization, I think, that can be done with uh, facilities management. I think yeah. one of the examples you gave there. Um, just to let everyone know, we're getting towards the end now of the webinar. So if you do have some questions, now is your time to, to ask. Um, I think last thing from me really was, um, you know, just in general, I think like it's really interesting what you're doing with this app store concept. I mean, uh, and you kind of alluded to it a little bit before about letting developers come in and, and you know, contribute or their apps obviously similar to, to what Apple do, I'm sure. Yeah. Maybe you could talk about that process a little bit, like how, if someone is interested in developing an application, like how, how, does, how, how do they do that? What programming language 
they have to use are there like development environments they they need to use that kind of stuff yeah, uh, sure. Um, so the operating system is, is based on, on Android, Android um, the, the Android open source project. Um, so what we did is we um, reduced the footprint um, to also reduce the attack surface. Obviously, we hardened it further. Um, we put in a different video pipeline. So it's, it's adapted um, based on that. So it's, it's um, um, different, different uh, languages that, that work with Android um, um, that developers can use. And that's, of course, also a big benefit because the community of Android developers is just huge. And um, that um, allows also, as I said earlier, um, for, for developers that come in from outside um, the industry. Now, what they ha would have to do is um, they, they, they sign up um, um, via our platform and we'll do some, um, some, some checks in the background and then give them access to the developer environment and to the documentation, as well as the possibility to upload then the app in the developer console. And they download the developer environment um, um, software um, um, from us um, and then they can start developing developing um, um, we also have some some example apps in the in the documentation that they can um, download to, to better understand how, how to program that and once they've um, they finalized their app then they would um, upload it in the developer console it's basically the back end of the store um, where they would put um, um, then the the apk and and all the details on the app and then um, 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 and to also price and, and availability in certain countries um, that, they, that they wish to sell it in. And then it um, is not uploaded directly to the store, but it's um, released um, from the app developer and it goes into um, um, uh, um, a process where we do some, some checking on, on the security of the app and making sure that there's no malware in the store, um, looking at, um, at all the metadata that is provided and then releasing it and publishing it in the application store so that everyone um, can, can start purchasing this, this app. Okay, yeah, makes sense. And I mean, in terms of time scale, I know obviously you, you can't uh, yeah. understand how long it takes someone to develop the app, but like, for example, how long would it take someone to get um, the authorization to download the development environment? That kind of thing. That that that, that is that is um, quite fast. So um, the the, uh, the, um, the terms where, where it takes some time is is the, is the registration. It takes um, um, not more than two days, but it's not instantly because mm -hmm. um, we need to do some uh, some some checkings um, in, in the back um, that's done uh, with a partner of ours, and that um, uh, takes some time. So registration will not be um, instantly. You register, and then um, within forty eight hours. Uh, you'll get um, yeah, um, basically uh, an email to, to be able to access um, everything. And then there's no more um, yeah, additional um, step um, to download and to develop a tool chain or any of that. Um, actually, since you've just been talking about how long does it take to create an app, um, that can be um, very fast depending on the app and the complexity of the app, of course. Um, mm. But we did hackathons here where um, where and people were creating apps, for example, for a museum and um, a flash detector. So um, what you don't want in a museum is that people always um, go with their cameras or phones and, and flash the pictures. And a detector that just basically gives an alert um, saying um, someone used a flash there and that app was created in just one day. Um, so Cool, yeah. Uh, question here for you. Um, do you have a list of camera make, uh, manufacturers supporting your apps concept? Yes, we do. Um, I don't have the slide here, um, um, to be honest, but um, it is um, it is um, Hanwha, it's um, Vivotech, it's BST Security, it's um, Top View, um, and it's Bosch. So those um, camera manufacturer partners are currently um, having cameras out there or bringing out cameras on this platform. I'm assuming you're looking, obviously, to grow the ecosystem as well. So. Absolutely, yeah. We are yeah. currently in, in discussion with all major camera manufacturers. Okay, good start. Great. Um, and I suppose let's finish off, like, I mean, if somebody wants to uh, ask you some questions, like, in private or after this is finished. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I can see your email address there. Is is that the best way to get hold of you? Or Yeah, that's the best Twitter? way. Yeah. Please get in touch. You use um, Twitter, LinkedIn? 
Uh, LinkedIn, I do, yeah. Uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn also, um, yeah, with my name. <laughs> Twitter, good I don't stuff. use. <laughs> yeah, good for you. <laughs> Great. Well, look, um, I'm assuming that we've, uh, no one has any more questions, but, and we've, uh, we're very much close to finishing off. So I think it just remains for me to say, Nicholas, thank you for spending this time with us. And uh, it's really interesting what you're working on and uh, this whole, you know, AI analytics concept video, I think is going to explode in the next few years. So thanks for sharing that with us. And obviously, thank you to everyone for listening. Uh, and as I thank said you. previously, um, we have recorded this session, so it's going to go up on YouTube um, and you'll be able to find it on our website as well. And also, I think you get a, an email uh, tomorrow and there'll be a link there uh, in that email to, uh, to find the recording as well. So please share it with your colleagues. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you, James. Thank you.